it's a great pleasure to be able to talk um, to you this evening, even though in this extremely strange form. I want to start, as Carol has suggested, uh, by paying my own tribute to Sinclair Hood. I have two powerful memories of Sinclair. One derives from that year at the British School in 1981 when I was a PhD student and Sinclair, an already elderly visiting fellow. Sinclair and Rachel showed me great kindness, a kindness that included the somewhat hair-raising experience of being driven to sites in Attica by Sinclair. You can see something of the Mr. Toad in Sinclair, I think, in this photograph. The second memory is of Sinclair coming to give a paper to the Undergraduate Classical Society in Cambridge. He brought a Cretan sheep bell with him and announced that he would ring it every time he said something controversial. There was a lot of bell ringing during that talk. As I take you round early Athens this evening, I should apologize for what may seem to many some rather hair-raising driving as I necessarily cut some corners. And for the increasingly loud ringing of bells, you may imagine yourself to be hearing. When the Stavros Niarchos Foundation announced in October 2006 its plans for a cultural centre, which would include new premises for the National Library of Greece and the Greek National Opera, it was clear that the old Hippodrome at Phaleron in the municipality of Calithea was about to be turned into an exceptional place. What had become a derelict parking lot was going to be put right at the center of Greek cultural life. What archeologists discovered at that site and revealed in March, 2016, following four years of excavation, was that this site had been an even more exceptional place some 2,650 years ago. That the site held a large archaic cemetery had long been known. That it had been the site of judicial execution was persuasively argued by Karamopoulos in 1923. It's a pleasure to be able to offer you Karamopoulos's photos from his 1923 book, courtesy of a gift from St. James Fraser's widow of Sir James Fraser, author of The Golden Bough, commentary on Pausanias and on Ovid's Fasti, um, uh, who um, Sir James Fraser had acquired a copy of Karamopoulos's book in the year it was published, um, and his widow passed this on uh, to the Faculty of Classics, which still holds it, hence my scans. Karamopoulos reconstructed the ancient Greek execution method, referred to in classical texts as Apotumpanismas, um, on the basis of finds made in the 1915 excavations at Phaleron. And he illustrated it with these rather graphic and horrible drawings. 17 skeletons had been found in a mass grave and those skeletons had been attached to and effectively hanged from boards by iron cramps around their necks, wrists and ankles. But what Stella Krusulaki and her team from the West Attica effort made public in 2016 was their finding of not 17, but 79 skeletons, all in a single grave, all shackled, face down, apparently executed, at least in some cases, by a fatal blow in the head. Not all the skeletons have been able to be sexed and aged, but it's plausible that all 79 are male and that only one of them was over 50, and the majority were aged between 20 and 34. Karamopoulos had thought that his 17 skeletons might date to the 7th century BC, though some doubt was quickly thrown on his dating techniques and there were no grave goods in that mass grave. That the 79 skeletons date to some point in the later 7th century 
seemed certain from the associated pottery. Archaeology rarely sheds light on specific historical events. And those of us trained in the world of then new archaeology are perhaps particularly resistant to reading off event history from the archaeological record. But here we have a singular event. The execution in cold blood and presumably in a matter of minutes of 79 young or youngish men. We do not know what impact that event had on Athenians of the time. We do not know whether or not it left any mark in Athenian historical memory. Some have been keen to see in these young men supporters of the Olympic victor Chilon, whose failed coup led to the family of the Alcmeonidae becoming accursed. But any direct connection is uncertain and not very plausible. The story comes down to us briefly in Herodotus 571 and at greater length through a famous digression in Thucydides 1, 126. On Thucydides' account, I quote, those Athenians in charge of the siege raised them up when they saw they were dying in the sanctuary, agreeing that they would do no harm. And having led them away, executed them, ap agagontes, Apectenan. They did away with some who were sitting even at the altars of the solemn goddesses on their way past. From this act, they and the family line from them was called accursed and offenders against the goddess. Oral history may indeed have distorted exactly what happened to Chilon's supporters. But on the face of it, a story about killing suppliants on the Acropolis or at the altars of the Semnai on the Areopagus, does not fit well with mass execution at Phaleron. But the importance of the Phaleron executions for early Athenian history does not depend upon our being able to connect them with Chilon or with any other event in the seventh century BC. Their importance lies in what this extraordinary scene of execution tells us about archaic Athens. But while we have no way of connecting these individuals to any historic family, we can be pretty confident who they are in a more general sense and who executed them. The Achilles of the Iliad slaughters Trojan maidens on the grave of Patroclus. And Polyxena was held to have been sacrificed at Achilles' own tomb. But prisoners of war were rarely executed, in fact, in the Greek world. They were too valuable for that, valuable as hostages against good behavior. Think of the value to the Athenians, of the Spartans captured at Pylos in the Peloponnesian War. And valuable for the ransom that might be paid for them or the price they would yield as slaves. In a famous story in Plutarch's Cimon, the Athenian general Cimon gives the Delian League allies a choice with regard to the spoils from Sestos and Byzantium, as to whether they take the prisoners and leave the Athenians the rich jewelry or vice versa. The allies take the jewelry and mock the Athenians, who then gain fabulous profits when the friends and kinsmen of the captives came down from Phrygia and Lydia and ransomed every one of them at a great price. So, for all the stories of raids on the Athenian coasts by Megarians and Aegeanetans at various points in Athens' early history, and for all the coastal location of this Phaleron cemetery, it's unlikely that the Phaleron executions relate to war. When the current bioarchaeological work is complete, we may know more about any family links between these unfortunate victims. But we can already be pretty confident that what we have here is the consequence of civic disturbance. A concerted attempt had been made by a group of around 100 men or more to seize something, whether for themselves or for someone else. That attempt has been thwarted, those making the attempt captured with or without loss of life and punishment has been exacted. 
Historians like the sort of language I've just used. It's so wonderfully non-committal that it has the air not simply of admirable scholarly caution, but of objectivity. But it kills history dead. For history is nothing if we cannot identify agency. Things don't just happen in history, they're done. We must rephrase. Who in Athens had the ability to carry out the capture and execution of 79 men. And this is a minimum, of course. It might be that others in the cemetery too were executed on the same occasion or in association with the same set of events. We might initially be tempted to think that the answer might be one of a rival set of gangs and to imagine something like the situation Thucydides describes in Corsaira in the famous description of Stasis in book three, where first, those opposed to Athens burst into the council and killed Pythias, the volunteer proxenos of the Athenians and 60 others. And then later, the pro-Athenian people put 50 of their opponents on trial and condemned them to death. But the Phaleron context suggests something different from this. Whatever their date of, whatever their date, the burial in this cemetery of 17 men by Apotumpades Moss strongly suggests that this was the place at which judicial executions happened in Athens and at which those executed were buried. We should not hesitate to interpret our 79 skeletons as executed by the power of the state. Whatever those executed tried to seize was something that the state wanted to preserve. And given the size of the group executed, the prime candidate for what they wanted to seize is political power. In response to this attempt, the state has been able to muster still greater coercive power. It has reasserted its Weberian monopoly on legitimate violence and commanded sufficient support to make execution on this scale possible. But what is this scale? The population of Greek cities is notoriously difficult to calculate. For fourth century Athens, the adult male citizen body seems to have been of the order of 30,000. The fifth century population had been significantly larger, perhaps even double, but that was probably the result of a massive growth in the first half of the fifth century, at least partly through migration. Ian Morris once put the eighth century population of Athens, that's total population, not just adult males, at 10,000. If we stick with that figure of 10,000 for whatever 7th century date saw these 79 executions, then on that one fateful day, the Athenians executed 0.79% of their population. Or, given that adult males constitute about 25% of the total population, 3% of their adult male population. Not exactly decimation, but an extraordinary figure, and one that remains extraordinary even if we double the number we first thought of and reckon on 20,000 Athenians in the seventh century. To put it in perspective, 0.79% of the current UK population would be 529,000 people, almost five times the total UK population killed so far by COVID, and just short of the 600,000 UK residents who die each year in normal circumstances. This comparison is, of course, bizarre. Scale does matter. We can't even contemplate the execution of half a million people in the UK today, or even a quarter of a million people. So why do I so much want to impress upon you the scale of this exercise of state violence? I do so because the question of the nature of state power has been, and properly, central to writing the history of Athens in the Archaic period. And the question of the rise of the Greek state, central to archeological discussions of early Greece. But the two have rarely talked to each other. The Phaleron executions, I suggest, put history and archeology span into productive dialogue. For historians, the story of early Athens has rotated around three individuals, Draco, 
Solon and Pisistratus. The least storied of these, but the most important in this context, is Draco. For Draco, traditionally dated to around 620, all we have is the later tradition about how harsh his laws were, and the survival, through its continued use and fifth century reinscription, of his law on involuntary homicide. The importance of this law has been seen to lie in the possibility it establishes that someone who caused another's death might be recognized not to be responsible for it, and that family revenge might formally be ruled out. We should not rush, however, to think that the moment that the possibility of recognizing homicide to be involuntarily, involuntary was encoded in law was the moment at which it was first recognized. So rather, the significance of Draco's law resides in three features. The first is that it was part of a more extensive set of laws. What Draco's law said in detail is lost in antiquity's desire for a good story, laws written in blood. But whatever his laws enjoined, Draco set the precedent for Solon's extensive law code a generation later. The issue of whether it's correct to talk about archaic Greek lawgivers producing law codes has been disputed over the last generation, with Karl Hörleskamp maintaining that what you see in the epigraphic record, that is, nothing more extensive than isolated enactments before the fifth century, is all there was. But Solon is a certain exception to this rule, and it's perverse to deny some degree of codification to Draco. Codification matters because whereas isolated rules may be agreed in the wake of some particular event, a code of law is only possible if a community recognizes a central authority with a right to regulate its behavior in general. By the time of Solon, that authority was recognized to extend to where you could dig a well or plant a tree or how you dressed a corpse for burial. The second highly significant feature of Draco's legislation is a single Greek word in the homicide law. If the person killed accidentally has no living relatives to decide on the treatment of the killer, 10 members of the victim's family are to be chosen according to excellence, aristinden hyresthon. Much mistranslated as if meaning according to rank or according to good birth, Aristinden simply means according to excellence. For all that modern scholars have yearned for it, there is no evidence for any rank labeled the Aristoi in archaic Athens. And birth was never the sole criterion for being the best of the Athenians, any more than it was for being the best of the Achaeans. Later lexicographers knew this and translated Aristindan as men who had the reputation for living best. Why does the meaning of this word matter? It matters because it establishes that Draco's Athens had a criterion for a selection that was not based on birth, rank, or wealth. That criterion is here exercised by the 51 Ephetai, who are in charge of proceedings but it was clearly available for exercise more generally. The Aristotelian constitution of the Athenians twice repeats in chapter three, the claim that the Athenian magistrates were originally chosen according to excellence and wealth, Aristinden, Kai Plutinden. And we should entertain the thought that it was the criterion used for selecting the archons whose existence as presiding magistrates dates to some time before this. The third crucial feature of Draco's law is the existence of the 51 Ephetai themselves, who take charge here. 51 is a large number, both absolutely 
and particularly in relation to the size of 7th century Athens. Large numbers are good, above all, for ensuring that decisions are owned by the whole community. But 51 is also an odd number and implies that decisions will be reached by voting, that consensus is not required. This is not a body that deliberates until it agrees what is best, but it is a body where individuals are asked to choose options according to their individual judgment. The 79 Phaleron corpses bring out the importance of the 51 Ephetai. Athens can execute so large a number of its male population at once because it had already persuaded so many Athenians to commit themselves to running the city. The selection of the 51 Ephetai, along with the selection of 10 Archons a year, required the political mobilization of the male community and required that mobilization not simply for purposes of security or the prospects of plunder, but to police community behavior. This state apparatus was, to use Walter Badger's famous distinction, not merely dignified, it was clearly efficient. It could deliver not only a succession of magistrates, but the suppression of concerted action aimed to disrupt its action. Whatever the date of the 79 deaths, whether before or after Draco, those deaths show that the law could be and was imposed, that the right to a monopoly of legitimate violence could be and was asserted. Since when? Athenian tradition's various rationalizing stories of kings succeeded by archons is no help at all to our understanding of how and when Athens became a state in this classic and crucial Viberian sense. Can archaeology help? 45 years ago, I went as a first year undergraduate to Anthony Snodgrass's inaugural lecture, reprinted in his collection, Archaeology and the Emergence of Greece, that you see here. In that lecture, he deduced from the striking rise in burial numbers in late 8th century Athens, a population explosion that both required and enabled the rise of the Athenian state. For all archaeologists' reluctance to let go of that population explosion, Ian Morris's disaggregation of child and adult burials, along with the sharp decline in burial numbers after 700, very effectively demonstrated that changing burial numbers were a consequence of social decisions about burial, not, or not directly at least, a product of demography. Eighth century burials show communities across Attica actively discussing who did and who did not merit a place in the cemetery and how burial commemoration should relate to the living community. Athenian pottery iconography, at the same time, shows how important the funeral was as a moment to display status. The domination of late geometric pots, including pots intended to be seen publicly as funeral markers or dedications, by scenes of mourning, scenes of armed procession, scenes of fighting on land and sea, and scenes of dancing, shows how much of a Athenian 8th century life was one or another form of social competition. And the Dipilon jug, offering itself as a prize and incentive for frisky, does that mean dirty, dancing, gives us our earliest extensive Attic inscription and emphasizes the extension of that competition into the more private world of the drinking party. But for all the implication of those many old ships, that collaboration was occurring, or at least being imagined, on a significant scale, the variation in burial practice, which Anna Alexandridou has emphasized, is arguably what we should stress. The moment at which all this changes is the very end of the eighth century. 
the more we come to know, the more this is revealed as the moment of revolution. Burial numbers plummet. Inhumation of adults disappears. The small number of burials, other than burials of children in pots that can be traced in succeeding years, are spectacular affairs. Elaborate graves constructed to enable the body to be cremated, lying extended in the grave, and elaborate parallel cremation of sometimes specially made grave goods burned on a long offering table and falling into an offering trench. These spectacular burials seem to be reserved not only for a small number, but for a small number consisting entirely of men. In Athens itself, location of burial changes. The area that will come to be within the classical city wall is now left free of burial. At the same time, a new style of painting sweeps away not simply geometric figures, but also much of geometric iconography. In place of fighting on land and sea, we find scenes that clearly identify their reference point as story, indeed as myth. Odysseus is blinding of Polyphemus, or escape from the Cyclops cave under a ram, Heracles killing of the centaur Nessus. And on the Athenian Acropolis, where the most striking 8th century manifestations of cult activity was the dedication of monumental tripods, presumably a mark of competition, shortly after 700, sees two monumental terracotta female statuettes, one of them more or less life signs, dedicated. And perhaps, but only perhaps, since the remains are exiguous, Athena got her first temple then. The archaeological features of the seventh century were not, of course, unprecedented. One can find primary cremation before 700, though not with the same rituals. One can find some allusions to mythology in late geometric painting, most indisputably in the presence of centaurs. The drawing style of proto-attic pottery has clear roots in late geometric, with the experimentation seen in the centre here at the workshop of Athens um, National Museum 894 and the workshop of Athens National Museum 897. And more generally, the so-called orientalizing features that it displays had already been on display in some late 8th century gold bands, as you see on the right. But the overall pattern of archaeological material is quite different and in ways that imply profound social change. So what happened around 700? Later 8th century Athens had seen not only a continuation of the prominent female burials that had been a feature of the Athenian burial record from proto-geometric on, think only of the assertive, I'm taller than you, Dipilon Amphora, which I've rather reduced to size on this uh, particular slide, um, commemorating a woman's burial in the midst of all those monumental craters here expanded, uh, marking male graves. But for a short while, the privilege of conspicuous burial had been afforded, if not to all, then at least to a representative section of Athenians, children in due measure as well as adults. Significance of this graph from that point of view is where the child and the adult lines coincide. We expect as many uh, um, sub adult burials as we expect adult burials if the whole population is being represented. What's more, the iconography of Athenian pottery had celebrated the contribution to the community as women as well as men in celebrating the dancing that marked religious festivals, as well as the ship-based prowess and parading in arms that men uniquely contributed to civic life. But around 700, a group of Athenian men asserted themselves as an elite, and they seem to have done so by turning their particular knowledge into power. What the elite knew about was what was happening elsewhere, not only what stories were being told elsewhere, 
but the way in which stories were told, the knowledge that those stories gave was not merely political, but theological. Whatever Athena may have meant in the eighth century, in the seventh, she could be and was visualized, whether in those statues on the Acropolis or in proto-attic painting. And she was visualized first, coming to the aid of a man threatened by monstrous females. Where did that knowledge come from? Well, certainly from outside. One overlooked feature of the growth of settlement in Africa during the eighth century, though already emphasized by Anthony Snodgrass in that path-breaking inaugural lecture, was that an older pattern of settlement centered on places that looked out of Attica, Eleusis, Munichia, Thorikos, Frauron, Marathon, changed into a settlement pattern that looked inwards with a big settlement growth clustered around Athens itself. But the change in focus did not mean the end of contact with a wider world. The Greek alphabet was not invented in Athens, but acquired at some point in the middle of the eighth century from elsewhere. And what the alphabet enabled was the transmission of information over a distance, whether of time or of space, or indeed of metaphysical space between men and gods. All those sherds of pottery from the sanctuary of Zeus at Hymettus, with their addresses to Zeus and attempts at writing the alphabet, show clearly how important it had become to master this new technology. So how was this knowledge turned into power? For all the dramatic nature of the change between the world of 8th century Athens and the world of 7th century Athens, there's no sign of violent destruction in the archaeological record, and no trace of violent struggle in the traditions the Athenians came to tell about themselves. This is, of course, one reason why this revolution around 700 has gone long overlooked or underemphasized. But if there was no violence, this was presumably because the male elite who asserted their dominance were able to offer something tangible that convinced the rest of the community that they had the right to that dominance because of their excellence, Aristindem. It's not impossible that what they had to offer included successful expansion of Athenian power. Aegina had been one of the few places to have continued to show a steady supply of Attic late geometric pottery, when otherwise Athenian potters seemed to have increasingly sold only to Athenian customers. But the well-known phenomenon of much fine 7th century Athenian pottery coming from Aegina, which caused Sarah Morris to suggest that it might have been made there, suggests an increasingly prominent Athenian connection with Aegina. But the most obvious feature of 7th century Athens and Attica is the cult activity and the forms that it takes. Apart from the remains on the Acropolis itself, we have a rectangular temple, 24 meters by 12 meters, that is virtually as large as the late archaic temple of Athea on Aegina, at Eleusis. We have abundant votives marking the establishment of an Eleusinion on the north slope of the Acropolis. We have Lutrophoroi and figurines demonstrating a sanctuary of Nymphae on the south slope of the Acropolis that was already devoted especially to marriage. We have some 1500 sherds of pottery from the Artemis Munichia sanctuary, attesting in particular to the dedication of proto-attic pedestal craters and subgeometric crateriscoi, vessels that seem to be for the most part restricted to sanctuaries of Artemis. Relief plaques with mythological scenes and painted plaques, including the famous example from Sunion attributed to the Analatos painter, found along with masses of Corinthian figured pottery, included scenes of warriors and of padded dancers. And in Southern and Western Attica, an outbreak of so-called stemple idola uh, includes more than 50 um, from the site of Chiafathiti. Scholars have long observed, once more it was Anthony Snodgrass who took the lead, that in the course of the eighth century in Greece in general, 
the sanctuary took over from the grave as the site for the deposit and display of conspicuous wealth. Although conspicuously wealthy graves continue to be a feature of 7th century Africa, the rise of the sanctuary is a feature that only becomes clearer as more material is published. But what also becomes clear, as already the description I've given has emphasized, is that different sanctuaries attracted very different material. We're not dealing with lots of local sanctuaries attached to neighboring communities, all performing the same function. Rather, as Anarita Doroncio has argued in her splendid recent treatment of seventh century Athens, we have different sanctuaries meeting different needs for what is essentially a single community. We don't need to suppose that some individuals executed a master plan to deliver different forms of supernatural support in different places in order to account for this pattern. But we do need to suppose that a common theological understanding had come to be shared by Athenians. And that's unlikely to have happened by chance. An eighth century understanding of the gods, where getting the aid of the gods was a matter of a limited number of ritual actions, such as dancing, seems to be supplemented, if not replaced, by a seventh century mode where worshipping the gods involved exploring their relations with humans through the stories in which they were involved. Note the seventh century beginning for the phenomenon of the Homeric hymn, and in particular, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, notable for the way in which it parades its Attic connections. This history of Athens, rela related in antiquity by the Attidographers, and the history of Athens told by ancient historians until the present is, despite what we might see as Thucydides' best efforts to the contrary in his archaeology, a thin history that projects onto Athens a model where the hereditary authority found in the household is assumed to have evolved into a negotiated authority where criteria other than birth gradually asserted themselves as a basis for power. The archaeology of Athens offers no real support for that story. Instead, it offers us a story where nearby communities with a long history of intercommunication adapt to a world of increasing competition by increasing their coordination, but also by recognizing new sources of authority, both supernatural and political. And recognizing I have suggested that if Athens was to flourish in a wider world, those who could claim knowledge of that wider world had a claim to power. What sort of challenge to that power was represented by the 3% of the male population who met their deaths one day in the 7th century, we're unlikely ever to discover, though we can hope to gain some knowledge of how well or malnourished their lives had been. But what this mass grave has importantly underlined is the strength of the Athenian state by the time this challenge was suppressed. It was the eighth century that had been the age of experiment. The revolution that happened around 700 BC, much more than what would happen a century later with Solon, established both the theological and the political foundations on which Athenian cultural and political achievement was built. Thank you very much.